Good morning. So yeah, my uh, grandfather, Don Peglo, uh, was from here. Uh, my grandmother passed away in 1988, and he married Wanda Gr Gronbeck. I totally probably butchered her last name. Her husband, first husband, was a sheriff in the area. So if any of you got pulled over by him, I am only kind of related through a second marriage. Please don't take that out on me. Um, also, I, I know some of you are related to J uh, Jerry Van Cleve. Uh, Jerry Van Cleve lives in Carlisle also. He is the uh, minister at the uh, Polk County Jail. Uh, my church actually s helped sponsor his ministry. Uh, so those of you who are kind of related to the Van Cleves, I, I know them through association through that as well. But uh, thank you so much for the invitation this morning. Um, this week's the 4th of July. And uh, whenever I think of the 4th of July, I was in the United States Navy. And uh, we get to these certain holidays, and I always, like, think of veterans. And if you served in the United States military of any kind, or you're a current vet currently serving, you've served in the past, or if you have a relative who is currently serving, who has served in the past, would you stand, please? So. Yeah, yeah th thank you so much. Yeah, I, I joined the Navy in uh, 1999. I served till 2003. I was on the uh, USS Blue Ridge. I was stationed out of Yokosuka, Japan. So if uh, anybody after service wants to share some stories about your service, I'd love to, love to talk with you. But what I want to talk about this morning is service. And uh, within the church community, I, in 2023, we have like different ways we can reach out and serve. And I'm going to call some people out. I may not call everybody out, but if, if you serve like in the nursery, or is there anybody here like serving in a nursery capacity ever? Okay, one per, okay. You know, I, I love nursery work because I did nursery work for a little bit when my kids were little. Um, changing diapers on a regular basis is not fun. Uh, let's just be real. And it's like, I think it takes like a special person to go do that, have patience with that, have patience with like the temper tantrums that go with it. You know, you go in the nursery and you like, like there's one toy that everybody wants, even though there's a hundred toys. And like to be able to like fight through that and get everybody calm without losing your cool at the same time is like a gift, I believe. Uh, so, so we got that. Um, who is a Sunday school teacher? We got any Sunday school teachers in the room? Okay, we got some Sunday school teachers. Sunday school teaching is like the most underappreciated job in the church sometimes, I think. Because you're dealing with, with these young people on a Sunday morning, and they, they oftentimes come in cranky and moody. Uh, but you've been planning a lesson and prepping and preparing all week just for it to change at that last minute because the kids are coming in the way they are. You know, underappreciated, I think, you, you uh, Sunday school teachers. Or I teach high school Sunday school at, at my home church during the year. And uh, if I get the kids to actually listen to me on, like, where they can walk away and they go, hey, Jay, didn't you say something about Revelation chapter something? That's a win. I mean, let, let's just be real. Uh, who do we got for, like, youth workers in this church? You work with junior high, high school, youth ministry. We got some hands up here. God bless you. Um, I've been doing youth ministry for 19 years. Uh, you have to be crazy to do it, especially that long. Considering the average, like, youth worker lasts seven months in the nation, I believe was the last statistic I read. Uh, the average youth pastor lasts three years. Uh, that was a statistic I read, too. Be because, just to be real, uh, in youth ministry in my lifetime, I have been cursed at, flipped off, uh, threatened. I had one time a girl write, I hope Jay dies on Monday for a prayer request. I mean, I mean th 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 this is stuff that you get, and in all of that, you still got to love this kid and serve them, right? And the reason I kind of bring this up is, uh, being it's 4th of July, I want to talk about service this morning. And what I want to talk about is, okay, why do we serve? Who do we serve? Um, are you willing to serve? And are you willing to stay the course? So this morning, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Now, I'm going to do something here as I kind of read Isaiah chapter 6. I'm also going to kind of flip over to Revelation chapter 4. I'm going to give you permission to do something that maybe you don't get permission to do. Um, don't follow along with me as I read the first five verses and Revelation chapter 4. And the reason why I'm asking you not to follow along with me is because I want you to get a vision of what I'm reading to you. Like, like, like really just envision in your mind what this is that, that I'm going to present to you, all right? 
just get that clear vision. So starting in Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, In the year of King uh, Gerzi's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robes filling the temple. Uh, seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two uh, he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresh threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the trumpets were filling or while the temple was filling with smoke then i said woe to me for i am ruined because i am a man of unclean lips and i live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the lord of hosts in revelation chapter 4 again just kind of envision this you don't have to follow along just kind of envision what i'm reading here Revelation chapter 4, verses uh, 2 through 11. Immediately I, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a uh, jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and golden crowns on their head. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and the sounds and uh, peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of bur a fire burning before the throne, uh, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, uh, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they did not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders uh, will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they exist and were created. Do you got this picture in your mind, right? Uh, the, literally the throne room of God, and it isn't like some future like vision. I mean, this is like presence, like today. This is what is in reality today. The center and focus of all of that reality right now focuses on that throne, right? And there's these like creatures that even like are going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was and is to come, you know? And they're like calling out God's holiness, his unique holiness apart from all of creation. Do, do, do you picture this? Do, do you picture like the, 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 the thunder and the, the, the lightning and the, the rainbow around the throne and the, the 24 elders who are bowing down, they're worshiping the God creator of the universe, Right? The, the one who in Genesis says, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the God at the center and focus of all of reality for all time, presently, past, future, now. Do, do you got it in your minds? Because when we serve, I think this is the perspective that we need to have of who we serve. And this is what Isaiah was seeing in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. He is literally seeing the holy God, almighty creator of heaven and earth. Because this is the God that we serve. You got the picture in your mind. Because oftentimes when I think it comes to service, though, a lot of believers take uh, the, the belief that we had in the Navy. Like I was in the Navy, and it stood for like never again volunteer yourself. Uh, thank you for laughing at that. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, we take that approach. It's like, okay, there's an opportunity to serve. I wonder who's going to do it. You know, instead of like stepping forward out in faith and saying, no, in, in view of who God is, I'm willing to do this. Instead, we take a step back and we're like, I wonder who can do this. You know, especially when it comes to youth ministry. That's why I say bless you, youth ministers. Nobody volunteers to do youth ministry. I one time stood in front of my church, was begging for help like years ago. Now we got like 10 get people helping. It's amazing. That's why I'm able to come do this all summer. 
but, but we do that. we like, okay, someone else step forward and do this. Because ultimately what happens is when it comes to service, we forget who the God of the universe is, the one that speaks of here in Isaiah chapter 6. And we remove his throne from our hearts and we replace it with what I like to call baby high chair idol thrones. Right? And the reason why I use that as an example is because we just see this picture of this throne and then we look at a high chair. I mean, is there really a comparison, really? But yet, we tend to put that baby high chair idol throne before the throne where the God of the universe sits, right? And when it, when it comes to service, like, we, we begin to get excuses, and I think one of the big ones we have today is sports and activities and extracurricular things. You know, and, and it drives me nuts, you know, with it as a youth minister, you know, like I know what season it is by what kids are missing. I know when it's baseball, I know when it's football, I know when it's wrestling, I know when it's basketball, because those families and those kids are missing. And we, we take the God of the universe and remove him, and we put this baby high chair idol throne in his place, where we give our time, our money, and our effort to them. But yet when it comes to giving our time, our money, and our effort to God in that throne, it, it comes in second place. Because I think what happens has happened in our culture today, it's happened even within the churches in many places, I'm not saying here maybe, but you know, in general, is like church is just another activity. God is just another activity. Serving in the church is just another activity. And when it stands up against the activities of the day, I mean, let's just be real, baseball or church, and it's just another activity, I mean, a lot of families are going with baseball because it's fun. And they will spend all weekend long at the baseball fields and then they're too tired to do anything involving and serving the God of the universe. Because our perspective of who God is is so little now. You know, we, we don't have that clear vision of the throne room of God and just how amazing and awesome he is. And we replace him with baby high chair idol thrones. Or even the technology today. Uh, I turned my cell phone off so it won't go off on me during service. But can you imagine this? We replace the God of the universe with this. And when it comes to serving, well, I, I can't because, and we make up some lame excuse because realistically there's a television program we got to watch. I actually did have that as an excuse given to me one time. Uh, I guess Doctor Who was on Sunday nights. And I like Doctor Who, uh, but not enough to miss church. Uh, this individual, uh, the, the newer Doctor Who, she, she couldn't miss a newer episode of Doctor Who because, yeah. Uh, not that it didn't come out on DVD or something we could watch later, but she missed out on the opportunity to serve that particular evening for Doctor Who. I mean, really, God of the universe replaced by Doctor Who? I mean, it, it, does anybody hear how pathetic this actually sounds? And, and I've been in the same position where I've chose, okay, you know, something else instead of maybe serving, like, okay, I don't want to. And I make up in my mind why I'm not going to, and then I found myself lounging on the couch watching TV. I mean, it's really kind of pathetic, you know. It's kind of lame. Think about that, though. Envision of who God is. Will you serve him? But second else, will you serve him in, in view of what he's done for us? Because it says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with thongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. Will you be willing to serve God in view of what he has done for you? And we have to ask the question, okay, what has God done for me? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4 says this, uh, For what I see if I pass on to you is first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and he raised again on the third day according to the scripture. In view of what has God done for us? Again, what has God done for me? It says in Romans chapter 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What has God done for me? Oh yeah, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for my sins. To take my sin, to take my iniquity upon himself on the cross and literally die in it uh, before I was even willing to give him my sin, right? Before I was willing to even give up my sin, he did it for me. So I would have the opportunity to be reconciled to God. And, and we, we look at these two views, right? We have a, the, the view and the glimpse of heaven, the literal throne room of God, and how awesome and amazing he is. 
and then the view of what God has done for us through Christ Jesus. Like, we, we, we should be chopping at the bit to serve. Because uh, God loves us through service we show Christ's love. Have you ever think about that? You know, because of what Christ did for me in view of that, I should be wanting and desiring to pass that along to somebody else. Because it tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 through 14, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not use your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbors yourself. I love that. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but to serve someone else. Why? Because we're all to love our neighbors as ourselves. Right? It tells us in Romans chapter 13, uh, oh, I just forgot this verse. I'm going to have to read it. <laughs> oh, nothing to anyone except for the continued debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery. I do not steal, do not murder, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there is are all summed up in this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. For love does no harm to his neighbor, for love is the fulfillment of the law. You know, we as believers ought to be stepping out in faith constantly, okay, in view of what God has done for us. Not that we owe God anything. Not that we can ever repay him for what Christ did for us on the cross. But we ought to be willing to, to step out and say, you know what, I'm going I'm to pay that love for like a debt that can never be paid off in service to others. To, to love my neighbor as myself as much as I can. And if that means I'm going to the nursery to, to wipe kids' rear ends, we ought to be doing it. But I think sometimes it is within a, a church setting, and again, it's not everybody within a church setting, but we, we have a, a few who kind of volunteer, and then we have a lot of those who are just always taken in. And we're always taking in, and that's great. We, we want to take in the love of others. We want to, you know, as someone's wanting to serve us, we ought to be willing to, okay, open up and allow that to come into our lives. But we can only take in so much because eventually what happens is we get constipated. You know, did I say that out loud? Whoops. Uh, but but that, that's what kind of happens. And uh, so I'm just going to go with this, and service is the laxative for that. I mean, like, we, we step out, we just let it go. I, hopefully I didn't offend anybody. So sometimes things come to mind, they come out the mouth. I don't even know where it came from. Um, <laughs> I mean, youth ministry too long. Uh, so <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, but, but we do that. Don't just be one who constantly takes in, but in view of who God is, in view of God's throne, in view of the love that God has for us that he shared with us through Jesus Christ, we ought to be willing to go, no, step out. I'm going I'm to take that and I'm going to overflow it onto others through service to them, no matter what capacity that is. So so in view of all that, it says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Lord, here am I. Send me. So here's Isaiah. He, he gets this vision of God and his throne. He's understands okay, what God has done for him by taking away his sins. And because of that, when the Lord's like, oh, who will I send? And what I love about this is, like, no mission has even been laid out for Isaiah yet. We're going to get to that in, in verse 9 here in a second, and it's not a pretty picture. But, but no mission for Isaiah has even been laid out yet, and he's got his hand up, and he's like, here am I. Send, send me, because he, he gets the vision. He understands the view of who God is in God's throne room, how awesome, amazing God is. He understands the forgiveness of his, of his sins. And we, as, you know, even kind of looking back at the cross, can see what it took to take our sins away from us. And he's just like, here am I. Wh whatever you got for me, God, I'm here. You know, and, and I, I love this picture again of Matthew in uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 27, where it says, um, after he and he being Jesus went out and noticed the tax collector named Levi, who was Matthew, uh, sitting in the tax booth, he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind, got up, and began to follow him. I love that. Matthew sitting in a tax booth. Jesus comes by, he's like, follow me. And Matthew just left it all behind and went. The vision and view of who God is. We don't even know how Matthew maybe knew Jesus, maybe heard him preach before or something, but he had the vision. Who God is and what God has done for us. Um, for me, and I'm going to give you maybe a short little brief testimony myself as of late. 
Um, I've been in youth ministry for 19 years, and about oh, it was a year and a half ago, my pastor came up to me, and he says, um, you can preach, can't you? I've been praying for you, and you can preach, right? I was like, well, I don't know. I've never been an opportunity. So on a graduation Sunday, he stuck me in front of a congregation of 300 people. Um, no, no pressure. And uh, I, I, I preached. And apparently it was decent enough where the deacons and the pastor decided I get to do this again. Uh, so I, I did it again. Apparently that was good enough. They let me do it again. And then in January, a preaching schedule came out, and I was on it uh, for the year for four dates. And uh, after uh, my March date, um, it, it was talked about that I needed more opportunities. Uh, so I thought very little. My, my, my vision was kind of little. And I, I reached out to just some local churches in my community, thinking if I get one opportunity, um, that would be amazing. Well, um, I got the one opportunity in April, and it wasn't by circumstances I wish I had gotten it. Uh, what had happened was is we had a car crash in Carlisle, and it killed a 16-year-old who was a friend of my daughter's. And um, I, I went to the wake, and, uh, sorry, I, I went to the wake, and I was uh, standing there. My daughter went through the line. I was going to wait to the end, and while I was standing there, this uh, pastor in the community came up to talk to me, and he goes, uh, just so you know, the, the guy in front with a beard was this young lady's stepdad, and he was your contact for this one church. So I waited till the end. I went up, and I shook the man's hand, and I didn't tell him who I was, but he asked me my name, so I said, and he goes, oh, you're the guy who called me on my phone for Pope of Phil. I said, yeah, it was me. And we talked for a minute, and I walked away. Uh, about three weeks later, he, uh, he called me on a Wednesday night, and um, he said, Jay, I... Uh, I hate to do this to you. Uh, I've been so busy dealing with my daughter's death that I forgot we needed a Pope and Phil for literally this coming Sunday. I know it's Wednesday. Can you do it? And I was like, yeah, I'm there. So I went and filled at his church. And I thought, okay, you know, after I did this, it was great, and I was glad to do it for him. And um, I thought, okay, well, that's my one Pope and Phil for the summer. Thanks, God. I, I, and I, I was grateful for it. Uh, but I call it this weird Holy Spirit thing on my heart. Um, my, my pastor was like, uh, yeah, well, I want you to try to reach out a little bit more. And next thing you know, I sent 500 emails. Um, <laughs> and again, thinking of small vision, I mean, even in view of the throne, in view of the cross, you know, in my mind, it's got this like little small vision of what God's going to do with me. And I'm thinking, okay, one more Pope of Phil this summer, I'm great. Two more, fantastic. Three, I'm over the moon. Um, I've been doing Pope of Phil's every Sunday for two months now, <laughs> all over the state of Iowa, and I got two more months of scheduled Pope of Phil's so for, coming up. I even preached this last Wednesday in Harlan, Iowa, and I got one Sunday where I'm preaching at three churches. And, uh, but are we open to that? Are you open to that? I'm not saying God's going to take you and sweep you away and have you go across the state back and forth doing things, but even in your own church and your own community. Are you open to say, here I am, Lord, whatever you got for me, I, I'm in. Even before I know what the mission is, because trust me, I didn't know what the mission was. I, I thought in my, in my small, pathetic Jay Grogan mind that one or two fills, and this was God's, God's great design for me and plan. He's like, yeah, I think, I think a little bigger than that, Jay. And I think he thinks a little bigger with all of our lives. No, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God planned in advance for us to do. Like before the creation of the world, he thought of you, had you in mind, and he's like, brother, sister, I mean, whatever, I got something for you far beyond your wildest imaginations if you're just willing to say, here I am. I, I, I'm yours. Right? And what I'm going to read you in a second is going to put maybe negative for a second, but I want you to see it in a bigger picture perspective. Because in Isaiah chapter 9, th th this gets a little rough. Or Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, this gets a little rough. He said, go and tell the people, this is Isaiah's mission that he volunteered for beforehand, beforehand. He said, go and tell the people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of the people insensitive, their eyes dull, their ears dim, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? 
And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed uh, man far, fr- far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning, like a thir- thermborth <laughs> or an oak, uh, whose stump remains uh, when it has failed. Uh, the holy seed is a stump. Um, I don't know if you kind of read into this, but Isaiah's mission wasn't exactly uh, a Sunday night balloon fight at youth group. Or, or like it uh, wasn't you no know, ice cream and sunshine and rainbows where people were skipping through the forest all happy. I mean, th- th- this is like not the mission that you want. I'm going to go preach to people who aren't going to listen to me. I'm going to go see people who don't want to have anything to do with me. Um, and how long? He's going to do it until the land is desolate and there's nobody left. And that was his mission. And, and sometimes we're like unwilling to go help out with VBS. I mean, let's just put that in perspective for a second. Uh, are you willing to stay the course? Because I'm going to tell you something. Ministry and serving Jesus isn't always easy and it isn't always fun. Like I said, I one time had a girl write, um, I hope Jay dies on Monday for a prayer request. Uh, By the way, I loved on that kid like crazy. And when she sees me at church, I'm like the only leader she wants to hang around with. Because she was worth it. And I'm going to tell you something, service is worth it, even when it's hard, even when it's messy, even when it's frustrating, even when no one's listening to you, even when no one wants having to do with you, it's worth it. And I, I kind of got a perspective of this just, just to, you know, like last night. Um, I've been on mission trips before with our young people, and you know, I, it's hard leaving my family at home to go do things. I got four kids. Uh, 18, 16, 14, and 11. And doing this for like 19 years, there was times when there was babies, I, I left them to go do something. You know, as little kids, I left them with mom to go do something. Now as teenagers, I'm le- I leave them to go do something. And it's hard, but it, it, it was easier knowing I was with other believers to go do this stuff. Um, I had a hard time yesterday. Um, I, 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 someone gave me some money. I came up and got a hotel room here last night because uh, uh, this retired pastor was like, it's a lot easier to preach after driving five minutes than it is four hours. He, he's, he's not wrong. <laughs> um, uh, but yesterday, it was like it hit me. I, just, I didn't want to leave home. It was like, I, I even like, teared up. I like, I, God, I'm going to go four hours from here without anybody. It's just me and the road. And I had a pastor a couple of weeks ago tell me I needed to embrace that. You know, embrace the wilderness experience with God. But it was tough. And I'm lucky I got supportive people at home because my teenagers and my wife literally hugged me and pushed me towards the door. And they're like, you're not going to be happy unless you just go do this. Ministry can be tough. It can be lonely. It can be frustrating. But I'm going to tell you something. It's worth it. Every mile I drove was worth it to be here, to, to, to pray over this congregation, to hope, okay, something sinks in today that you take with you, not just for the rest of the week, but the rest of your life. When you're stepping up to serve, and like, I don't know if I want to, and oh yeah, that crazy dude with a beard who's not very handsome stood in front of me one day, and he's like, dude, pers- who's God in pers- view of this, view of what he's done for me? Yeah, I'm here. I'll go change the baby's diapers in the nursery. Yeah, I'll go help out with that youth ministry, even though junior hires are crazy. Yeah, I'll go help out with that Sunday school program because there's a need. Yeah, I'll go help out with that food drive or that can drive or whatever it is. Because it's worth it. Man, it's worth every second of it. And I wouldn't have traded this for anything. I'm going to tell you something because you'll look back at your life. And I, I believe this hardly. I can't find it in the scripture, but I think this is this is the case. I think someday we're going to stand in heaven actually looking back at our lives and our existence. And I think we're going to see warehouses full of blessings that people didn't get because they weren't willing to step out in faith and do something. They weren't willing to step out and serve. And I wonder if God's going to stand back and go, hey, all this was for you, but you didn't want it. Man, I want every bit of it. And And my prayer is that you do too because it is worth it. And Jesus is worth it. And I would be, like, not doing my job if I didn't come here and do this one more thing before I sat down. 
because I believe there's a, a constant message that I have, I've delivered to every church I've been at, and I'm going to deliver it here too. That the Bible tells us that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone in this room has. You know, I, I, we have that vision of God and his throne, how holy, holy, holy he is, how uniquely holy he is. And we are so far from that that we can't even approach it. It's like the sun. You know, try put walking towards the sun. You're just going to disintegrate, and you're not going to be no more. Like, that, that's the, how we approach. We, we can't approach the throne room of God. The, the void and the gap is too wide. But the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one only begotten Son. Whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you catch that? God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. For whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, God's love isn't like exclusive to those people who just show up on Sunday mornings. If this is your first time here ever, uh, it's not exclusive to those who are here every week. It's for you too. And you can say to yourself, well, Jay, you don't know the sin I've committed. You don't understand how far I am from this. I'm going to tell you something, that the, the Bible isn't like some 12-step AA program where we have to do a bunch of things in order to approach the throne room of God. The Bible tells us God demonstrates his love for us in this, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to tell you something, you're looking at a guy who drunk it, or drank himself stupid in 16 different countries in this world. You're looking at a guy who, who looked at so many inappropriate things I should have my eyes gouged out. You're looking at a guy who used to go into inappropriate establishments and do inappropriate things. And yet, if God can forgive me, he can forgive you too. Amen. God's love isn't exclusive to, to those who live the good and perfect life. He came for the broken. He came for the lost. He came for the sinners. He came for the, the, the dirty and the gritty and the grimy people of this world. And Jesus loves you. And don't you ever forget it. And if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never reached out in faith, because I tell you what, from the cross he reached out to you. And all you got to do is reach back. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. And if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, if you want to be forgiven of your sins, if you want God to give you a new heart, we're going to do that right here this morning. And then afterwards, I would love it if you would come and talk to me about it. I would love it if you would find one of the overseers of this church and talk to them about it. We can get you. I don't know if you guys have Bibles hanging around here. We'll get you one. We'll, we'll, we'll get you material. We'll pray for you. We'll love on you. And then we're also going to pray, too, this morning for just as in general service, that we, we begin to see God in view of who he is. We begin to see God in, just in view of what Christ has done for us. We, we have the willing hearts just to raise our hand and say, here I am, Lord, send me, despite what the mission is. And that we're willing to, to, to step out the door in faith, leave our families behind four hours away, whatever it is, to come and do what God has called us to do. Because I'm going to tell you what, it's worth it. So ever, bow your heads and close your eyes. Grace, tell me, Father, God, I'm a sinner. And I make mistakes like everybody else. God, and I have, I am, I'm so far from where you are and who you are, Lord. But, Lord, I, I believe in your word where it, it says, you know, you, you sent Jesus to this earth. You sent Jesus for me and Jesus, I believe that Jesus took my sin he took my shame, and he died in it, and he was buried and raised again on the third day. I believe that. And I pray, God, that you would just come into my life, that you would just remove this old, dirty heart from me and give me a new one and make me clean and whole again. God, I thank you for what Christ did for me. God, I, too, pray also for the members of this congregation this morning. Maybe we, we've just lost perspective of who you are, and we've replaced you with these, like, baby heights or idol thrones. Father, I pray for forgiveness. I pray, God, that we, you give us eyes to see who you are and your holiness and your goodness and your greatness. God, I, I, I pray we begin to uh, remember, Lord, what Christ has done for us and the love that you have just lavished on us that we can turn and just you know, give it out to others, Father. God, I pray for just that willing spirit to step up and serve. God, I pray that even when the mission is hard, we remember that it's worth it. And then we never forget these three words, I am loved. That you love us and that you're with us and that you give us the courage and the strength to do it even when it's hard. God, thank you for uh, 
this church. I thank you for the opportunity. Again, we just lift up Pastor Joel to you as he's away this weekend. May he just get the rest he needs and time with his family that you would bring him back, you know, strengthened and renewed to lead this congregation. Guys, pray these things again in Jesus' name. Amen.